Well, thank you, George. Um, and thank you to Dr. Maurer and Anne and the organizers. Um, it's always fun to be in Baltimore. Um, and at this conference, I guess, an interesting and symbolically pertinent, perhaps, setup to have um, these consortium representatives as well as representatives from the mainstream publishers, um, technology providers. I'll actually be brief uh, because I know that Matt has a lot to go through, um, and especially uh, following on to, to Stephen's presentation, uh, he brought up a lot of the points that I normally bring up as well, and I'm not going to repeat all that stuff to you again. Um, so only a, a few um, things here regarding um, EPUB 3 as a foundation for inclusive publishing. So, um, on this slide there are two words, publishing and republishing, separated by a, a pipe or a war character. This represents, to me, now, um, a retrospective. This is how the DAISY Consortium members, um, well, I don't mean insult DAISY Consortium members by oversimplifying the world, but for me as a DAISY Consortium uh, staff member, and having worked in the business for a long time, this was my view of the world. There were two separate streams of content, one coming from publishers and the other coming from republishers. Tying back to, to Stephen King's presentation, of course, this is now what is quickly and radically changing. So this slide shows a very blurry, as if you had low vision, uh, picture of the traditional Darwinistic evolution where you go from early primates up to homo sapiens. All of this is changing. The duality is going away and we're in a radically disruptive time in terms of mainstream publishing as well as accessible publishing. I'd argue that information society in general, much through the ebook revolution, has come to a stage now where it's becoming a natural assumption of, of process and of policy to publish in ways that, that benefits all. And note that I'm not just talking about, and this is actually one of the points I want to make here, I'm just not talking about print disabilities and the fact that print disability people's needs have been recognized and understood better, but it's a more general principle. So following on from the ebook revolution um, that's happening, well, with different paces throughout the world, but definitely will be all over the world within a few years. There's this general uh, awakening in, in the mainstream, and in, in the commercial providers of e-document and e-book services, services that it doesn't work like it used to. You can't publish content in one way, in a static way, and expect it to be a good user experience. So everybody now in the, in the uh, e-book industry, publishers and service providers, are thinking about ways to make the content more responsive. There's this movement called responsive design, for example, which is all about figuring out where the user is, what's your context, what's your device, and in what modality do you want to consume this content. So this is a general way that the mainstream is now trying to improve itself and make the digital reading experience better. And luckily, of course, for us, it turns out that accessibility and, and the reading experience for people with print disabilities is just a natural part of that, of adapting uh, content and the reading experience to the user. Um, yeah. So, I have a quote here from Stephen King. He held a presentation in Baltimore in um, June 2012, where he said, we must build in inclusiveness, not reach out for it. So this is, in a way, you know, a, 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 a core statement of, of the change that is happening now. To some extent, automatically, based on what I previous said, previously said, but also, of course, because of the activities that, that the DAISY Consortium and the IDPF has been engaged in, in terms of trying to build the foundation jointly for a publishing paradigm that is inclusive. 
So um, I'll assume that most of you um, already know a fair amount about the <coughs> uh, and its accessibility and usability <coughs> features. Um, I won't go into detail here because I need to be brief. There are freely available books from O'Reilly uh, that take you through um, the, the uh, basics of EPUB 3 in the first publication that come out, came out, what is EPUB 3, and also the second one, accessible EPUB 3. Also, I, if you're interested in more details about differences between, or the new features of, of EPUB 3, I, I advise you to look out for Garth Conboy from Google's presentation later today, or tomorrow, I think it's today. He will go into more detail um, than, than I will here. I try to delegate as much work as I can to my friends at Google these days, and it's working great. <laughs> um, so let's see what else I have to say here. So yeah, EPUB 3 as a foundation. It, uh, as most of you know then, is uh, a, a, a specification produced by the International Digital Publishing Forum. It came out in October last year, and there's been an enormous amount of activity going on since then. A bit of what uh, I will tell you, give you a few examples later down the road. Um, Daisy participated very actively in this revision. And again, thinking about the general mainstream movement of moving towards more adaptive and responsive <coughs> books, we um, at Daisy initially were a bit worried that our uh, accessibility requirements for, for an ebook standard would be rejected. Uh, but it turned out to be very, very easy. Everybody understands the benefits of being able to have human recorded narration available in ebooks, for example. It became available in Apple iBooks, uh, human narration synchronization, in May 2011. That's like six months before the spec was even done. It's called Read Aloud in, in iBooks, but it's based on EPUB 3 media overlays. And so on, the examples continue. So, in retrospect, I'd say what well, was easy. Matt and I almost died anyway, but that's a separate story. Um, <clears throat> so, um, with uh, this slide shows a, a pyramid, which is kind of a lame and overused metaphor for trying to build something, but I could come up with something better. Um, so as everybody knows, a standard and a specification for how to do things uh, is, is merely the fundament. There's a huge pile, as, as uh, Stephen talked about as well, of things that needs to be done on top of this in order to make it work, become functional uh, across the globe. Uh, I won't list all the other factors because there's not enough space. I think this is even the uh, one of the larger pyramids on the Giza plateau, but there's still not enough space for, for all the different um, aspects and factors. So I just thought I'd mention a few of the things that we are working on right now as sort of the next uh, step in a very pragmatic sense, that is excluding uh, many of the factors that Stephen talked about, such as uh, policy making and partnerships and all that. These are a couple of things that we're working on right now that, that Matt will talk about in more detail soon. So first, uh, guidelines and samples. So the O'Reilly Book Suite is an example of, of trying to push knowledge um, from the Daisy Consortium out to the mainstream in terms of what constitutes an accessible publication and why and especially how that benefits everyone, and not only people with disabilities. So our work with, with guidelines and education and knowledge dissemination is, is ongoing, and it's going to have to be ongoing for a long time. Um, the O'Reilly piece is, is only one aspect of that. The other thing we're working on, and sorry for the uh, bad fonts there, is, is publicly available information about the state of various tools in the tool chain. So we're talking about publisher tools, end user reading system tools, we're talking about uh, basically the entire chain from start to end. Okay. To have publicly available information uh, about these tools uh, and what features they provide. It's good for many reasons. Uh, uh, end user information before you uh, embark on purchasing something or becoming a member of a service, you need to know what it provides. 
And also, uh, publicity of inf information has proven to be a very powerful tool to get uh, vendors and service providers to, to um, how do you say this in American, shape up. Um, this has proven to be the case of the web, for example, where 10 years ago, browser uh, interoperability and functionality was a disaster. And today is actually very good. And part of the puzzle that made the web improve was actually uh, the provision of, of public information and tests that essentially made the vendors compete against each other to be as interoperable and, and compatible as possible. Uh, and the third uh, concrete thing that we're working on is, is checking tools. Matt will be talking about that as well. There needs to be simple ways for anyone in the chain to figure out uh, primarily regarding content, actual books, what, um, if any, they are missing in terms of accessibility features. So there's a number of, of tools that are need to be available, um, as Stephen mentioned, this as well. So those are three concrete things we're working at the moment, more info from Matt in about three or four minutes. So before we move on, I just wanted to mention a few of the uh, uh, events or um, uh, examples of, of progress that have happened lately. Um, these are just a random pick and not exclusive. And if, if any of you uh, have done great stuff lately that I don't mention here, uh, feel free to make sure that everybody hears it here on the conference before we leave. So in this spring, um, I can't remember with which month, but in the spring there was an e-accessibility symposium in Paris. It's held uh, every three or four years. For those of you who were there, you had the, um, the opportunity to listen to Gerald Schmidt from Pearson UK, who talked about what they have done to their uh, school um, and education material provision system, how they converted it to use EPUB 3 as the, the backbone, the server master version of, uh, of their content lives as EPUB 3, and through that they're able to publish um, school books through ebook channels, web channels, and apps. And what Gerald said, which has struck me as, as wonderful, is that in this uh, back end server where they have all the content, they run these nightly builds to push out and refresh the content every night, apparently. And Gerald said that for us now, accessibility is a build criteria. It's not something that you perhaps add when you have the time. Accessibility needs to be there for the actual nightly build to carry through. So here, um, accessibility has been reduced to, to, to a bug. It's just a bug, we need to fix it. And I think that's a beautiful image. What else? Uh, two weeks ago, iBooks announced support for EPUB 3. Um, so, uh, in terms of availability of content, and I just uh, visited the um, Book Expo America uh, conference in New York, and I can tell you that there's, um, there's a lot of activity going on, on now in the industry in terms of, of moving to EPUB 3. So the iBooks announcement, of course, is, is, is paramount to that. Another cool thing that, that they've done is to support what we in the EPUB spec call um, semantic inflection. This is a way that you can enhance content so that it's semantically and structurally richer. In the case of iBooks, they support this for footnotes, so that if the publisher provides the footnote semantic in the books, which isn't available by default, um, the iBooks client can do a lot of clever stuff with it for everyone, such as hiding footnotes conditionally and popping them up when you hover over a footnote reference or then similar things. And this, of course, as most of you who use assistive technology knows, is, is paramount to the AT reading experience. It's only with rich semantics that you can get a good reading experience with a screen reader. So here's another example of how uh, functionality in EPUB 3 benefits everyone, not just people with print disabilities. InDesign 6, uh, I don't know if Keo is here yet, but I believe he'll be here tomorrow and talk about InDesign, which since a couple, since a month, I believe, has been available and has Save Us EPUB 3 built in. 
Um, one of the things they do there is that they have a new feature called Advanced Adaptive Layout. Again, note the word adaptive here. Again, a very important aspect in the mainstream to adapt and be responsive to, to users and devices. This is a thing that could have enormous accessibility uh, uh, bonuses coming because it will help publishers move away from the static fixed layout publications that are inherently, uh, or at least very often, less accessible than the reflowable typical publications are. So this is something to look out for. Uh, it's still the early days, uh, but, but extremely exciting uh, for accessibility and for the quality of ebooks in general. Next, Readium uh, is an open source effort uh, intending to provide a, a open and freely available reference implementation of an EPUB3 reading system. Readium.org is the address. There's a huge number of commercial companies involved in building this. The idea is to provide not only a ready-to-use reading system, but also engine parts that hardware and software manufacturers can reuse in their own tools. So it's a very, very active uh, open source project. One of the things happening there, in terms of accessibility now, I just wanted to mention this, is that DAISY on our side has contributed an implementation of media overlays, that is text-to-speech synchronization, uh, which almost works if you download it today, but not entirely, it's a few more weeks. Um, Benetech Bookshare has just started to working on the text, uh, text-to-speak, um, text-to-speech, sorry, uh, integration in Review, so that you will be able to uh, use Review with, with uh, TTS. So again, this is an open source project where um, uh, um, DAISY Consortium representatives and the mainstream work together towards the same goal, and it's all natural. Vital Source is one of the um, major league, I believe, textbook publishers in the US. They made a press release this Monday. They're um, rolling out now their entire um, school um, system for, for learning materials based on EPUB 3. Uh, they showed a demo of it at, at BEA. One of the really cool things they have done is that they have integrated EPUB 3 with QTI. I don't know if you know what that is, but there's the IMS uh, Global Learning Consortium, I believe they're called, who ha has this standard for, for uh, tests and assessments, right? which is used a lot uh, already. So in the vital source of um, setup, uh, EPUB 3 and QTI is integrated and can be used together. Google, um, their, the uh, speed with, with which their clients has been improving accessibility-wise uh, for the web, for iOS and Android, um, is also, I think, a, a, a clear example of progress. I hear that the improvements uh, done with Google has been done in close co collaboration with NFB. Um, so that's also fantastic. The EPUB Standard Widget Toolkit, and this is my final uh, bullet, um, is an effort that IDPF is about to start, which will provide an open source set of libraries for interactive widgets to include in books. So, one of the problems today for publishers is that you can do all these enhanced interactive things, but it's costly because you have to write code and you have to make sure it's stable and you have to make sure it's accessible. So it's uphill for many publishers, especially smaller ones. So by providing a, a, a standard toolkit with these things pre-built, and of course by us being present and making sure that the, the widgets and interactions are, are, are accessible, we can again create a win-win situation where publishers reduces cost and stress, and we make sure that the quality is maintained. And the reason I bring this up here is just that I wanted to mention that I talked about this at BEA this week, and the interest from textbook and, and trade publishers is just huge. So I have every reason to believe that this is going to be a big success. And I'm three minutes over time. So turning over to Matt. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephen, as well, for, for your excellent introduction. It, it sort of sets the stage for, for where I 
want to go and, and take off from, which is really, as, as, as we've been saying, that the future is now, that we have a unique opportunity at this point in time to change the way that we you know, make content accessible to people. We, the, the, the retrofitting, as, as Stephen King you know, has called it, doesn't work. It, we can't keep up. We can't you know, add accessibility on the scale that the publishing industry can create information. Um, and we can't, you know, retrofitting also applies not just to the content itself, but to formats. We can't take a format, take something that was done aside, as Dr. Maurer was saying at the beginning with Windows, to try to add accessibility after the fact into formats. You know, we, we know that at this point in time doesn't work. And that's what I think is really unique about EPUB 3 uh, in the way that it, it's embraced the DAISY format, that we've got the standards coming together so that we have a fully accessible format that people can use and that accommodates multiple reading modalities. Because as, as we've been saying, we, we frame the issue often as a print disability, that, that that's what accessible ebooks are offering. But I think you know another way of looking at it is that accessible ebooks allow anybody to read how they want to read. There's, there's not one way of reading a book. And even for somebody who reads with their you know, eyes and, and fingers, it changes. You, you may want to sit you know, sometime and read, you know, say at lunchtime in your office. But then when you're going home on the subway or on a bus, you don't want to sit and read while you're bumping along on the road. You maybe want to put on the headphones and listen for a while, get home at night again, switch back. So it, it goes beyond you know, just saying that this is a, a disability or this is something that's limited to a specific you know, market. There's there's broad application. I think that's what we're just beginning to discover right now too. Is is all the ways that you know the general public can benefit because people don't even realize too. You know, things like cold, closed captioning have been around for years, and people take advantage of it. If you're in the airport and you're sitting, they've got the news on the TV screen and the captions are running below it. You you take advantage of these you know of these abilities when they're provided for you. But if we're not providing them for people, then of course you know they're they're not going to be there. Um, and so it is, it really is a unique point in the history of publishing to me that we're at right now, where we've got a chance to bring all of these different reading abilities into a single format. It's not requiring you know, a separate production method anymore. So you don't have to make Daisy and make an ebook. You make one book, you make it rich, you put in you know, rich content for people, and you, you can meet that requirement. And I think another important point too is, is the interrelation or interplay of data and reading systems. I think sometimes you know, people get a perception because it's, it's loaded into the reading system and the reading system is where you see sort of the magic, as I like to call it, happening. People sort of think, well, data doesn't matter then. The reading system will do everything for you. And I, I don't think for reading system developers or for content creators, there's, I don't think that, that that perception is there. It really is you know, a symbiotic relationship. Good data is what reading system developers need in order to create really, you know, advanced functionality. And without, you know, rich data, you know, they're not going anywhere. Without a rich reading system, all the great data in the world is absolutely useless, right? If, if you can't present it to people in a way that's useful to them, then you have nothing. And as sort of as, as Marcus was bringing up too, it's another, you know, sort of, not common argument, but um, opinion, I guess, uh, on data, is that you only build your data rich enough to what's available currently on the market. And I think that's a very narrow way of, of, of seeing the value in your data. You need your data to be as rich as you can possibly make it with your workflows. Because things happen, things change and evolve over time, as, as Marcus mentioned, the, you know, Apple, uh, the footnotes. If you weren't doing that, if you were just putting footnotes, you know, formatting them, laying them out, or you know, without the semantic markup, along comes you know the reading system that suddenly is able to take advantage of semantic markup to create the pop-up footnotes. Well, all every book that you created up to that point in time has to be redone, right? Because you didn't put any of that information in. So you never look at what you know is currently available on the market. Always try to take the perspective. How rich and how you know, meaningful can I make my data? And that's where I get into you know what I'm going to really kind of sort of uh, delve into through the rest of the presentation is how do we begin to strengthen workflows? 
Because we need, if, if we're going to have an inclusive design, we, we've got to start building this from the ground up. And, and Stephen, you know, keenly hit on one point, which is that the author is one of the big resources that you need to look to. Because when it comes down to this, and certainly everybody you know, in the DAISY community who's had to try to recreate the books from print knows you, you've lost information. By the time that book comes to you, it's a final form and you have no access to the source that created it. And unless you have the expertise on hand, trying to get back to what the author was thinking, what they were trying to convey, can be extremely difficult to do. Even, even in an internal workflow, even if you, you start setting up an inclusive system, if you leave it to your QA people to try to figure out what the author was thinking, it's the same issue. They're not in a position to know what, you know, what even, if, you know, and I should say too, even if, even if the author isn't the best person to write the description, at least if you can get the information from them, you know, you're, you're well on your way. Um, maximizing the use of tools as well, hopefully. We'll, we'll hear more about that today and tomorrow. If you take a simple layout tool and you don't optimize it, it's going to do what it was designed to do. If you put text in, it will put text back out. You need to understand, or you, your people need to understand, what are the accessibility functions? How do we use them? How do we use, you know, InDesign is a great example. You, it's got styling built into it to help you improve what comes out of it. But if you don't know that it's there, you're not going to use it, you're going to get very basic, non-accessible books. Books in which the logical reading order gets lost because everything just becomes paragraphs and part of the text. And so, building in the checks, um, I, this is where I'm going to start to diverge now. Um, validation and quality assurance. I mean, these, these are not necessarily things that happen at the end of the chain. You know, even your editorial staff, people should be watching and following. The, the longer, the, the more you wait to start thinking about accessibility in the chain, the more costly it's going to be to try to put it back in. And there's two sort of differences here that I, I, I'm going to try to make between validation and quality assurance. Because it's not the case that just because something comes out of EPUB check is valid, it's accessible. Right? EPUB check is very good at doing binary testing of logic. It, it tells you yes and no type answers. If you put in, you know, this tag must appear at this position. This attribute must be, um, you know, must have a resource that's in the container. Those sorts of questions, a, a validation tool can tell you, yes, this is true. No, it's not true. There's an error here. It, it can't think for you. It can't tell you what could I have done better. You know, what did I miss? What, what structures did I not tag? Because you can do it, you know, as, as people have said, you can make very inaccessible books, even with EPUB 3, that are going to come out of EPUB check. Because they're completely valid to the standard, right? It, it, it's not going to think. Although, I'll, I'll come back to that too, because, you know, one of the points I'm going to get to is, uh, is, is tied into the, the checklist and, and hopefully has some potential to, uh, to increase what we can do with EPUB check. But, I was going to actually demo EPUB check, but I didn't want to scare everybody off with it today. <laughs> I know people don't like it, uh, or not, not like it, that's, that's going too far. Um, it, it, it can be daunting, but it's absolutely essential that your publications validate because it ensures that they're going to render, which is a huge part too. I mean, accessible is important, but if you just get a blank page because you didn't validate your document, and you try to load it up. You know, I, I, I can show you know, chapter one, fine, put an error in chapter two, chapter two just disappears, and then it goes on to chapter three. So that's why you, you still have to make sure that your content <coughs> validates. Um, and EPUB check, it's, it's free, it's open source, you can grab it from, there's a Google project, Google code hosting site. Uh, it's customizable, you can put it into your internal workflows, have your, have your data people you know, work it in somehow. Um, Marcus, I believe, still is working on graphical interface to come hopefully soon. Um, there's also, in development, is a plug-in architecture. And that's what I was saying, that where we have a potential to start putting in more accessibility is in a modular fashion. Because a lot of, a lot of the statements that are saying that, that EPUB check can validate are often, for accessibility purposes, going to be warnings. 
So it's going to tell you, you know, you might have done something wrong here. I'm not 100% sure, right? It can make that determination, absolutely. But it can start to tell you, this doesn't look quite right. And that's something that you can plug in so that it's not always cluttering up your, your, uh, your output, your, your validation report. And so, you know, knowing what, what I guess the limits on EPUB check are, then the, the question becomes, how do we get people aware of accessibility issues and how do we get this information? You know, the, the DAISY community obviously, you know, is flush in knowledge, but we need to make sure that we're getting this information at this point in time out to the publishers so that people are more aware of, of what they need to be doing. And the first, um, first sort of step in that process was the accessibility of three O'Reilly book. And that we, we got out to back in uh, February for TOC. And it was really kind of trying to get out ahead of the game, get out, you know, even in advance of, of reading systems and people starting to provide content so that that information is available and out there so that people have a reference point to begin to, you know, to understand what it is that, that needs to be done and why these, why good markup matters. Because I don't think, it, it's always obvious why, you know, why lists are important, why tables are important. They, people may just say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's just a, you know, a stylistic consideration. And it's not. To understand, you know, what makes content accessible, you have to understand how people are navigating it in non-visual ways. And so this book, you know, it, it's, it's instructive, it's informative, it's not necessarily a coder's guide to EPUB, and that was, you know, and that is, is intentional. It, it, it splits up accessibility into, you know, sort of two big domains, one being um, the quality of your markup, the traditional ebook, making sure that you understand the issues with structure, semantics, making sure that you're putting all of this information into your book. And then the second part starts to begin with a lot of the new features in EPUB 3, which is dealing with interactivity, audio, video, scripting, media overlays, all these, you know, the, the, the additional functionality that we sort of see being built on top of, of the traditional ebook. Um, but as I said, it, it has its limitations. If you're sitting down and you have a validation error or you're going through your book, you don't necessarily want to have to go back to a guide and start pulling out you know pages in the book. Everybody likes quick reference, Google, you know, find find content snippets. And so that was the second part of you know our objective here was to build a, a you know a, a, a checklist of accessibility requirements. So people have something that they can literally sit down with in bullet point form and go through and say, you know, have I met this criteria? Have I met this criteria? And and check them off. And so I'm going to switch here to the website. Hopefully. Oh, here we come. That this is something that I've been working on for the last couple of months. Um, and I'll say right up front too, it's it's still very much a work in progress. We're soliciting feedback, and and you know, if anybody has, you know, if you read through it, hopefully. You find anything you think is missing, anything that you think might be, you know, you know wrong. Um, you know, please, there's there's a contact form at the bottom of the page. You know, get involved with this. This is going to continue to grow, continue to to move forward as we learn more too. It's it's meant to be a living document. But what it is is a breakdown of accessibility by how traditionally a book would be broken down in large parts. So we've broken up, you know, semantics is, is taken out. Um, so you can go through, find out what the logical reading order is, uh, how to use the EPUB type attribute. Um, we've got, you know, content documents. I'm going to pull up one of the pages here quickly to show. Uh, I'll just grab the language. And so each of these pages it follows the same basic uh, model where we begin with an introduction to why it's not just a general guide to like here's every tag in HTML5 and you know how do you go and use them. You can go to the specifications to get that sort of information. This is really why are these you know why are these tagging principles important 
for accessible production. And, and without going into the whole book approach, we we'll just give a quick synopsis at the top, the, the rationale why to give that information so people understand why it is they're doing what they're doing. Because if you don't understand that, if somebody just tells you you have to do things and you forget it, you, you don't really, you know, it's not going to get, you know, sort of squeezed into your brain, you know, so that it becomes part of your natural thinking process of how you should be structuring your data. Um, after descriptions, we, we give code snippets, things that you can actually, you know, good practices so you can pull them right out and, and use them in your own work. Uh, accessibility checkpoints, this I'm going to come back to as well because, as I say, we do have a big checklist that is actually, you know, something that you can use to verify your documents. But at the same time, we've broken them out. So as you're looking at each page, you can see what the specific points are that you should be you know, implementing in your content. And, and two, the, the checkpoints, I, I should be upfront as well, it's, it's not meant to be, you know, compl it's not going to give you compliance to a specific code. You know, it, it, they're meant to encompass the best practices for each of you know, these, these uh, markup points that, that you encounter. So it, it may get you, you know, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines level, you know, A. I'm not trying to lay out those sorts of, of, of requirements here or Section 508 compliance. These are just general good practices. You know, the more of these that you get, the more likely you are, obviously, to get higher and higher ratings on whatever your, your local or national requirements are for for compliance. Again, we give compliance references out to the WCAG, to HTML5, quick links to the information, so you can look up from here uh, additional resources, additional you know, pages on the web that we have, uh, frequently asked questions. Hopefully these will be growing for the pages as we go along. This is something I want to, as I said, keep this a living document so that you know information grows here. We keep a constant record that people can reference. Um, and again, because a lot of a lot of tagging requires knowledge. I think one of the sort of the, the good examples here. I'm going to bring up the emphasis in bolding page. If you don't understand what how to apply emphasis in bolding, a need pub check. You know, even even if you get it sorted right, you're you know, even if you put the m tags in, you have to know the distinguishment between am I trying to do. You know, vocal stress, am I trying to imply mood change, right? There's there's actual knowledge behind it. It's not just, sometimes you see people on the web just say, oh, just use I, just use M. You know, in all cases, don't use CSS. But there are cases for using CSS. If you don't, if you're not applying anything, if you're just visually formatting something, which is perfectly fine, if it's just, you know, a random, non-essential italics or bolding, use CSS because it's not important. You don't want to draw somebody's attention to it. You don't want a rating system to change the mood or change the tone. And as well, it's you know, there's I'm, I'm kind of scrolling down the page here quickly. Uh, there's MathML section. There's SVG. This is um, formatted. You probably you know or not. At the top, there's a table of contents heading. Um, it's also in EPUB 3. You can download this entire site. There's a link at the bottom. So that's why this looks, it, it's not the most exciting or, or wonderful looking uh, front page, but it is actually an EPUB navigation document as well in disguise. So, so quick access to information is really the key, laying it out in a way that people can find what they're looking for and get into it quick. Um, scrolling down here quickly, I want to just sort of bring this page up. Here, the CSS property reference as well. This is something that is, is still very early. It's an attempt to understand some of the issues with styling. Because we talk a lot about structural markup and you know, what's, what's happening under the hood. But there is still a very important visual component to ebooks. They are, that is still the predominant part of the market. And so understanding visually even, you know, what are good practices, what are bad practices, is something I think that we, we haven't really addressed. And so, you know, I don't want to claim this is perfect by any stretch, but it's a start, it's an attempt to get the information together. So you can look up a property and find out, say, you know, if, you know, text alignment, you know, justif justifying text for dyslexic readers sometimes, 
you know, the, the white space that gets caused between words is problematic. So it's, it's again, it's, it's a knowledge resource. It's a way of, of, of giving people you know, a reference point so that they don't have to go out and find all these issues themselves. Um, metadata here as well. I'll talk about this quickly. Um, Onyx Code List 196 now includes metadata compliance in our code points. Uh, you can put in all of the accessible criteria that you need, but in a, it's generally formatted in the Onyx standard or any kind of ebook. It's not, you know, this code list is for EPUB 3. And so what I've done on this page is go through each of the Onyx compliance criteria and you know, give um, a background into how they apply to EPUB 3. Because I, I almost made the mistake myself in the, in the O'Reilly book. I was going through and going, oh yeah, you, it's, it's great. You know, EPUB 3, you get rich structural navigation by default. Because I said, think, oh, well, everybody in Daisy puts the whole table of contents in. So, no, <laughs> you, it's not the case. You actually have to go and put in all the layers of navigation. You have to put all the heading levels in. If you just do a flat, you know, top level table of contents, you don't need that Onyx code point. The Onyx code point is very specific that it is full navigation. So there is, you know, a component here as well to, to understand what it is that, you know, is required to meet these components. Um, I'm going to bring up quickly at the bottom of the, the page is the actual full markup checklist. And this is also broken up by area too. It's, it's, I'll pull up the full page. Um, it's big, long, lots and lots and lots of points to go through. Not all of them are going to apply to every single ebook that you make. If, if you're not putting in media overlays, obviously, you know, the considerations for it aren't going to apply to you. So it, it is, you know, just a quick reference point here too to, to not have to deal with the whole list if you don't want to. Um, ideally, you know, you should be going through and, and verifying everything. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a long list. It, it links back in as well. There are links after each of the major sections back to the information pages so you can work from here if you want and then find more information if you don't understand what the issues are. It again, it's, it parallels what is on the main page uh, detailing compliance criteria. Uh, it's a checklist, so I don't want to dwell on it. Uh, one of the other interesting ones we have that's very, very much in, in early development stage is a reading system checklist as well. And this came about actually just, just I was talking with George and he was uh, asking me how the, the EPUB navigation document is supposed to render. And we don't define that. The EPUB navigation document is a is declarative markup. So it looks like XHTML, but really it's it's intended for the reading system to ingest and you know do what uh, do whatever it wants with it. And the worst, or well not the worst, but the, the most basic thing it can do is render it as XHTML, which then leaves the user to have to manually navigate through a whole bunch of lists. And that's not optimized. You know, people want hotkey access. People want to be able to skip and jump around through it. And so that's that sort of was the basis that everything that we're saying is important for markup has a corollary on the reading system front end for what it should be doing to enable access. And so the reading system checklist kind of goes through and, and starts detailing some of these points like what should happen after you close your footnote, you should go back and be able to continue reading right from the point that you left. You should have to kind of navigate back and try to find out where you started. Uh, one last point before I, I move on from here. Uh, there is some forward-looking information. Um, I'm going to quickly bring up the EPUB described data attribute. This is something that, and it's got a big warning right at the top as well. Um, it's in the works. It's, it's potentially a way to deal with the lack of a long desk attribute uh, predicated off of an ARIA described ad, which would eventually replace the EPUB described ad or complement it. Um, 
it's, it's, you know, and, I, and again, I, I, I think there's a, the talk is tomorrow on diagram project. So I, I'll just say that it's, it's also, there is an attempt to standardize what you find on the end of the, the description. So there's, there's information in here that we're going to work into the checklist later. Not everything that's in the checklist is, is on the front page. There may be more information from the main table of contents because not everything is implemented at this point in time. Back here, right, and so that that's kind of the, the, the quick and as fast as I can do an introduction to to the guidelines and the information. It still leaves the question of how do we check the content to ensure that it is compliant with the checklist. And you can you can manually do it. You can manually sit with a, a, a checklist and take a take all the points. But I think you know realistically it should be back at the tool level, right? It should be something that's integrated into your initial layout so that you don't have to leave it further down the line. But another idea that, that we're sort of mulling and, and, and looking over at this point in time is an interactive quality assurance tool. So a way to load an EPUB and begin an accessibility check to you know, be able to step through known issues, whether it's you know, going through all of your images or be able to find the logical reading order and determine whether or not you know, content is going to conflict with it that should have been in the logical reading order or shouldn't have been. Uh, but again, this is this is very, very early concept. If it interests you, certainly the people on the stage, George, Marcus, and I, are, are the ones to come and talk to about it. Um, another quick point I'll just uh, bring up is the EPUB samples project. Uh, it's not necessarily specifically geared to accessibility only. This is I, it's completely featureful at this point. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, Marcus has been, been working madly away at this, I know, getting content in so that we have you know, a test base for reading systems, so that we have uh, you know, full examples for people to be able to pull up and look at the markup and actually have examples. Because sort of the, the real point that we're trying to make here is that you need to have an active developer community. An active developer community comes from information. If you just build a standard and leave it and don't support it, right? I mean, if, if you're stuck having to build files to it, great, but it's not going to go anywhere. And to get it to go anywhere and to get people on board and to get and to honestly get inclusive publishing to happen, we need this information out there. And so that's what we've really, really been kind of pushing. Um, I probably, yeah, I won't go through the, the accessibility metadata. I kind of jumped the gun on that one and, and, uh, and talked about it earlier. But it is, it, you know, make sure you're putting that information into your ebooks as well. This is another one where it's, it's very early. Um, we can't point specifically, I, I don't know of a bookstore that's, that's using it at the moment, but it's something that's going to have to come into place. The ability to filter results, the ability to find books, the ability to get a description of what accessibility features are in your book. Don't go and make a great accessible book and then leave people no way to find it, right? It's, it's, it's important information to have out there, even for their own purchasing purposes, right? It, somebody's gonna want to know is if there are known conflicts or known issues with the book, it, it simplifies life for them so that they can find the content that they're looking for. And so yeah, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up now and just sort of say, yeah, reinforce that this really is you know, a unique point in time. We really have this opportunity. And it's, it's moving, it's really rolling at this point, I, I think, in terms of getting the information out there, in terms of getting people to understand. And, and so, you know, the future's really bright, that's all I can say. So, thank you. Um, I don't know if people have questions or not, but certainly welcome.